Welcome to Bible Study with Pastor Brenda. I'm glad you're here. I am Pastor Brenda. We've been looking at the book of 1 John. We have looked at chapter 1 and we've looked at most of chapter 2. However, there was a pause for Easter and a few other things. And so it's been a little while since we've been there. So it's probably best we start with a review. Now, um, we did all of chapter 1, and like I said, most of chapter 2. And um, I think it's great that we remind ourselves of what chapter 1 and chapter 2 said, so we can kind of see how the rest of it flows. Now, if you're watching us on the internet and you have been watch watching us in order, there's not going to be a delay, but it is always good to repeat ourselves and to have a little reputation to be able to remember what we looked at. You know, Jesus, well, the Bible in general, does repetition quite often in the scriptures so that we can remember. And it is important for us to remember. So, let's talk about where we've been. But before we do that, let's go ahead and open up in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your Son that lived out that word so that we can follow in his steps. Thank you, Lord God, for all that you've given us. Father, impart us with your wisdom, the, the wisdom of your Spirit, so that we can discern what we're learning and what is going on in the world around us. And help us, dear God, to be able to, to follow you and to stay with you no matter what happens in our lives. You are such a great and glorious God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. So, okay, so let's jump right into this review. Um, at the top of chapter 2, John explains his purpose, or at least on some idea the purpose of writing this letter. He tells us a couple of times throughout uh, the passage or throughout the book that, that he's writing for various things. And he says in plain words, though, in this chapter, I am writing to you that you may not sin. And that's big. He starts off with, I am writing these things. What things? What things is he writing? The things he has already said, as well as those that are yet to come. So, John, in... Uh, chapter 1, verse 8, he states that sin is in fact, at least an occasional fact anyway, in life of a Christian, we are going to sin. We don't want to, we try hard not to, but it is a fact part of our being. And in chapter not, sorry, chapter 1, verse 9, um, he makes it clear that if you do not sin, or I'm sorry, if you do sin, that there is always forgiveness from confessed sin. However, John wants to also make it very clear that Christians should be concerned about sin. And so one of the reasons for writing this particular letter is that we may not sin so that we may not sin. He also said that if you walk in the light, you will have fellowship with one another. You see, when we are walking in the light, we are naturally having fellowship with our Father. But when believers walk in the light, they are also having fellowship with one another. And if you and a fellow believer have issues, then either one or both are not walking in the light. Some pretty stuff, pretty heavy stuff. John is really quite a serious letter, um, 1 John. And, um, and it really gets to the heart of the issues. John previously rebuked the idea that um, we can become sinlessly perfect. We just cannot do that. He says that in 1 John 1.8. At the same time, he wants to make it very clear that we do not have to sin. 
All the resources for spiritual victory are ours in Jesus Christ. And that resource is never withdrawn. It's always available to you and to me. We just don't call on it enough. And that's sad. We have these resources that God gives to us and we don't even use them. John addresses this because of our relationship with God. And, and for us to have a relationship as God intended for us to have a relationship, he reminds us in verse 6 of the fact that sin can break that relationship that we have with God. The good news is, is that there has been made an advocate for us, a defense lawyer, if you will, who is on our side, and that advocate is Jesus Christ himself. It is as if we're standing as the accused in this heavenly court and before our righteous judge, God the Father. And John refers to Jesus Christ as the righteous, which means that Jesus is fully qualified to serve as our advocate because he himself is sinlessly perfect. Sinlessly perfect. John also makes this link between our obedience and our love for God when he writes, But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. If we lose love, then we lose everything. There is nothing left. You remember what he says, Hope, faith, and love, and of the greater of these is love. It is all too easy for people um, to place politics or ministry or just simply being right above love for the body of Christ and for those around us. We, you know, we must always do the right thing. However, though we must be right, we must be right while we are in love. Did that make sense? We can be right with no love, but that does not make us right. We need to be right and do so in love. Get it? I think sometimes we want our rightness to, to be lifted up. And when we want our rightness to be lifted up, but we leave love behind us, we end up sinning because we are all so about being right than we are about doing what is right in the Lord through love. And so we can do all the right things and, and even doing the right things without that love part, we lose what God has intended for us and how we're supposed to live. Um, the scripture on the screen says from 1 John 2, 15 through 17, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. Pretty heavy stuff, huh? John pulls no punches. John tells us that the world is passing away. And he then goes on to tell us that whoever does the will of the Father lives forever which stands in strong contrast to the world passing away. Because some things are forever. There are things that are forever. And it is much wiser to invest our lives into that which cannot be lost. And you cannot ever go wrong when you are doing the will of the Father. You want to know what types of things don't pass away? Love, faith, hope, generosity kindness, the fruits of the Spirit, but things that do pass away, well, those can be lost. We want to focus in on the will of God and do the will of God, obedience and love. So, John goes on to tell us about the Antichrist, and he says the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have already come. And so there is a distinction between the Antichrist with a big A and many Antichrists with a little a. There is a spirit of Antichrist 
And this is the spirit of Antichrist, um, of Antichrist. One day, there will be the Antichrist, who is going to lead humanity into the end times, rebellion against God. But Antichrist is, I think if you remember, I was talking about Antichrist is not the, it's not the opposite of Jesus. Jesus is good, the Antichrist bad. Jesus is beautiful, Antichrist ugly. It's not like that. Um, though Jesus is good and the Antichrist is not good. Um, it's more on, um, gosh, what was that when we said that? I wonder if you remember. Not the opposite of, it is instead of, instead of Jesus. So anything that, anybody, anything, any teaching that comes instead of Jesus' teaching. Anybody who are looking at and putting up high instead of Jesus. Jesus is our Lord and Savior. He is the one that will save us. He is the one that has saved us. He is the one that will take us into eternity. Now the Antichrist, or many Antichrists, are, 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 they could be people, and, and, and they could be groups that come up against us and um, start teaching us differently or other things, maybe some worldly values, and we end up following them instead of Jesus. And so that's kind of where that went. It, it really comes from, there were some false teachings in the early church, and, and all of the apostles spoke about, you know, being aware of false teaching. The Bible is what we need to be following. We need to be following Jesus Christ's teachings, not the world's teachings. And the world can twist Jesus' teachings to make it sound right, even though it may not be right. So John reassures us by saying, but if you have an anointing from the Holy One, you know all things. Here John is referring to this common anointing belonging to all believers. It's this anointing that makes uh, it possible to have discernment. So we need this discernment that comes from the Holy Spirit in order to even seek and find Jesus, to be able to find the truth. So there's a common anointment that happens. Um, and oftentimes it's said that we all, you might have heard this, they, somebody might say, well, we all worship the same God. And, you know, we have one name for him and, and, and you might have another. Oh, we call him Allah, but you call him God or vice versa. Oh, no, it's the same God because it was God of Abraham. Well, somebody might tell you, oh, it's okay, um, we're just talking about different roads, but the same God, you know. We all have the same God. The same God that created the earth is the same God that, that, that I worship. Um, but, gosh, we got to ask the right questions. Because if we say, well, yes, of course, the God of Abraham, that, you know, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, that's what we say. Yeah, they say the God of Abraham, Ishmael, and Mohab, Mohammed. So is that the same God? What happened? Because our God teaches us and has revealed to us the Lord Jesus Christ, perfectly revealed to us, the one that was born of a virgin, the one that lived a, a sinless life, the one that died on the cross for us and our sins. He was buried in the grave and he rose again on the third day, alive. He ascends up into heaven and he's coming back for us. Is that your God? And if that's not your God, then honey, you don't worship the same God I worship because I worship the one true God. And so... Without the revelation of Jesus Christ, Christians need to stop agreeing to people of the world that we worship the same God. God made it very clear that there was one God. 
He's the creator of the earth, the sustainer of people, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. He is the author. And so we need to stop agreeing. And, and we've been put on this earth to tell the news, the good news, the gospel news, the truth. And um, we were not put on this earth to pacify other people to their gods and their ways. And we need to be very careful that we do not mislead anyone. Because if we start agreeing that their gods are God, then you know what we're doing? We're actually pointing people to hell. And that's not what we're supposed to be doing at all. In, in light of the danger of the spirit of the Antichrist, we protect ourselves against the spirit of the Antichrist by abiding in the original core Christian message. And the scripture tells us in chapter 2, that which you heard from the beginning. When John says that what you heard from the beginning, he's not describing from the moment we became a Christian, what we heard from that moment forward. No, he is talking about the original teachings of Jesus. From the beginning, those who, the apostles that were with Jesus, the holy book that was written for our benefit so that we would know the truth. The beginning means God's word, which we have been, which has been given to each of us. And so, we need to remember that which we first knew. Our world is filled with people seeking and searching for God. And some sincerely are seeking and some insincerely. But if someone really wants to know the living God, John tells us how. Let the message of the apostles, which you have heard from the beginning, live in you. And let it abide in you, which does not mean just knowing the Word of God, but living out the Word of God. When we are living in simplicity of the truth of Jesus Christ, then we will abide in the Son and in the Father's Word, God the Father. And here it says in verse 25 of chapter 2, This is the promise which He Himself made to us, eternal life. Amen. Amen. So then John goes on to talk about when, when his truth, whatever we heard from the beginning, lives in us, then God lives in us. When God lives in us, we have the promise of eternal life. Amen. The, the, the eternal life. Therefore, while the idea of eternal life has this reference to living be you know life beyond this present moment um, beyond this present world it it doesn't begin when we die no no if we don't have eternal life now well we're not going to have eternal life when we die and that is why it's so important to have this promise of eternal life right now and when we have this promise if if god truth abides in us in you and me and we then we abide in the son and the father and that's really great news and and because of that news we have hope we have hope and so when things are going really rotten in our lives which it seems like they have in many people's lives in the year 2020 slash coming into 2021 and people are struggling with these things that are going on all around them. And, and many are living in fear. But this promise of eternal life should not, uh, should not cause us to live in fear today. Because today's a blip. It's a moment in time. Our life is forevermore when we know Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. So when we, when we have a whole lifetime ahead of us, then this moment in time, this year of bad stuff with the, with the virus and with all the things going on and depression, this is nothing. But when we're only focused in on this earthly life, this life that we have right here on this earth, 
without the hope of eternal life, then depression will set in and worry will set in. And that's what we as Christians need to remember and we need to, to stop living in the moment of our problems and start remembering that we have the promise of eternal life. There is no fear of death because we live forever. And, and, and we need to remember that for decades. The world around us has tried to tell us that, that we need to live forever and, and we need to look young forever. But we know we live forever. And it's not on this earthly plane. And so we need to stop fearing today. We need to stop fearing death. And we need to start remembering that we have the promise of eternal life. Amen? Which now brings us to the final section of chapter 2. Our protection against deception. The anointing. So it's in verse 27. Um, the first question appears. What does the anointing teach us? John knew that there was deception among these early Christians. And he was concerned about this. And he had passion to keep them constant with God's message of truth. This abiding, this anointing, is able, it, it enables Christians to continue in the truth. Golly, one would think that that passage um, is actually where John is directly speaking to us here in the year 2021. I mean, really. Um, the truth is so difficult to find these days. And the mainstream media acts more like um, one-sided activists when they're delivering information to us. They are not um, acting like journalists where they give you two sides of an issue and help you where you get to think for yourself and discern what you are hearing. You get to... Um, uh, journalists allow give you the information so you can work on it. And if you disagree with what another person says... Um, that's just what you disagree about. We're able to find it. But today, we're not able to do that. Today, it's more propaganda. It's about, um, gosh, it's not about truth at all. And truth is so vitally important. And we need to be very, very careful that we don't get deceived by what we're hearing. Christians who fall for the lies of the world um, and then pass on these lies to other people are not doing a justice for anyone. Here's the deal. We are to speak truth and seek truth. And I find when most people are screaming one thing and they're locked on that one thing and, and they won't hear any other viewpoints or any other doctors or scientists or specialists or whatever is happening, they won't hear any other wisdom into the subject. That's usually when I say, whoa, if more people in the world are over here believing this, there's probably a truth over here that they haven't shared with us. And, and I know that may sound kind of crazy to some people, but the fact is, is that, remember, many people do not believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They do not follow God. They have kicked Him out of schools. They've kicked Him out of prayer. They have tried to eliminate God in all aspects of social life, whether it's politics or school or um, just everywhere. And so if the world, which is mostly ungodly, is trying to tell you something, then I would suggest you seek outside the main norm and find other answers until God reveals it through His anointed wisdom. And maybe the truth is what they're saying. But if we only accept what the world says, we are going to miss out on what Jesus is saying, what God's Word says. And remember, we are to be wise as serpents wise as serpents and gentle as a lamb. So anyway, um, just as he stated in John 1, 2, 20, you know all things. Jesus tells us again that the anointing we receive 
from God guides us to the truth. We are guided into truth on a one-to-one -one level, God confirming it in our hearts. Again, John's message is very simple. Because of the anointing of the Holy Spirit that has been given to all believers, they possess the resources for knowing the truth. This is not to say that teachers are unnecessary because one of the great resources is knowing the truth and being reminded by teachers like John who wrote it down for us. This anointing which guides us into the truth will also guide us closer to Jesus Christ. And so, the Apostle Paul he speaks of those who are barely saved. And uh, he says, He will suffer loss, but him, he himself will be saved. Yet, so as though, so as through fire, in 1 Corinthians 3.15. So, so what does that mean? There are those who, um, for at least a moment, the coming of Jesus will be the moment of disappointment rather than glory. And that's really sad. Some people have one foot in, one foot out. But where are they rooted? Where are they rooted? And so we want to be rooted into God's Word. We want to abide in God. It is important for us to, to carefully consider these matters before it is... Um, because it is difficult to measure the distance between barely saved and almost saved. That's kind of weird, isn't it? Barely saved and almost saved. There's not much difference there. It is dangerous. It is a dangerous contemplation. Um, how little can we do and still make it to heaven? You know, some people think that. What little can I do and still go to heaven? Or how far can I stray from the shepherd and still be a part of the flock? Instead, we should be diligent and not ashamed before him at his coming. And that's what John is trying to tell us there. If you abide in the faith of him, holding on to his truths, following his example, and making him um, your dwelling place, your Lord may come at any hour, and you will welcome him. Amen. And we want to be prepared to welcome him, and not to be curled up in the fetal position, um, crying because we thought we were ready. But we were not. We never grow beyond our need to abide and find our confidence in abiding in Jesus because John used this word we instead of you. We know that he needed this confidence also. This is the way to be confident when Jesus comes. When you abide in him, you are ready for Jesus to come at any time. The idea of living in Jesus is so important in the Bible. So important in the Bible. We can't go wrong with living for Jesus. Jesus promised in John 14, 23, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Amen. What beautiful words. What a beautiful reminder. Paul expressed this idea in his prayers in Ephesians, in Ephesians 3.17, that Christ may dwell in the hearts through faith. There are two Greek words to convey the idea to live in. One has the idea of living in a place as a stranger, and the other has an idea of settling down and a place to make a permanent home. To dwell in Ephesians 3.17 uses the ancient Greek word for permanent home, indicating that Jesus wants to settle down in your heart, not just visit as a stranger. 
I wonder, is Jesus dwelling in your heart? Or is he a stranger that just visits now and again? Have you totally opened your house to him and said, everything I have is yours, make yourself complete at home? Or do you just invite him over to dinner once in a while when you're needing him? Some serious contemplation there. Do you abide in him? Or do you just visit Jesus every once in a while? Abiding in Jesus gives us confidence because we know that we wouldn't change our lives substantially if we somehow knew that Jesus um, wasn't coming back, but we would change our lives substantially knowing that Jesus can come back tomorrow, next week. We would already be abiding in Him. We wouldn't have to change. So, so if, he's, if He's at home as a resident, there's not anything we would have to do differently because we're ready for Jesus, whether it's in five minutes or five more years or 500 more years. But if he's just a visitor, we'd be cleaning house, trying to get it all fixed up so the, the visitor could come. Scripture says, anyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Abiding in Jesus means that we will practice righteousness in our lives because we are born of him. Being born again has changed our lives to this disposition to sin and to a new position to righteousness. This is the test of our abiding in Him. The same kind of test that John mentions in 1 John 1.6. He mentions it in 2.4 and in 2.9. There is something wrong if someone claims to be born of Him and he does not practice righteousness. Poole writes, when someone is born of some when someone is born of someone else, there is almost always a family resemblance. You say, look, she has your mother's eyes, or oh, he has your father's nose. Well, the children of God have a family resemblance to their father in heaven. He is righteous. And those who are born of him also practice righteousness. God hath no children destitute, um, is that the word that Paul writes? Destitute of his image or who resemble him not. So God doesn't have any children that don't resemble him. If you're not resembling God, maybe you're not one of his kids. It's pretty much what Paul's saying anyway. We will not perfect righteousness until we are in glory with, um, with Jesus. But we can practice righteousness right here, right now, if we are born of Him. These are three uh, precious claims for each Christian in this chapter. In John 2.4, I know Him. In John 2.6, I abide in Him. And in John 2 9, I am in the light. John wants us to know that these statements are true. It is shown in our life. If they're true, it, they will be shown in our lives, especially in our loves for our brothers and sisters in Christ. So now, it's a really heavy chapter. I suggest go back and start again and read from the beginning chapters 1 and chapters 2. Just really soak it in. Drink it into your spirit because there's a lot of meat in here that we didn't even discuss over these weeks. And even if we did discuss them, I'm sure you don't remember a lot of what we've talked about. But really look at those words. Hear what God is saying to us through um, the Apostle John in 1 John chapters 1 and 2. Next week we're going to start chapter 3. Um, he's had such heavy stuff, so we'll have to see how chapter 3 goes, but we should be able to get through it a lot faster than chapter 2, unless he fills it full of all this meat again, and then we'll want to slow down and really look at it, because God's Word is so wonderful. I mean, it's kind of like a peeling an onion. You got an onion, onion, and when you first read it, you peel that first layer off, you see something. 
but the deeper and deeper you go through this onion, each layer getting peeled away, we see more and more and more. And don't worry if you're ever reading the Bible and you don't quite understand something completely the first time you read it through, because we are all in different stages of our walk with Jesus, and, and so He will open our eyes to what we need to know as we mature. And when we mature and we start reading the scriptures, we'll start seeing things we didn't see 10 years earlier or whatever when we were still babes in Christ. Because, boy, there is so much stuff here. And it's glorious to study His Word. And I'm so thankful that you have joined um, us today to study the book of 1 John. Let's go ahead and pray. Father God, there was a lot here. Oh, some good stuff. Some stuff that's made us think about our own relationship with your Son, Jesus Christ. Oh, Father, how I know I want to abide in you. I want you to abide in me. I want you to make residence in my heart and stay there, not just be a visitor coming and going. And I pray that for the people out there watching today. You are so great and glorious. Let us have a good week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, for goodness sakes, this was a good study, and I hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye now.